You're listening to The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, your escape to reality. Hello and welcome to The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Today is Wednesday, March 20th, 2024, and this is your host, Stephen Novella. Joining me this week are Bob Novella. Hey, everybody. Kara Santamaria. Howdy. Jay Novella. Hey, guys. And Evan Bernstein. Happy Equinox. Yeah, yesterday, the the 19th, was the first day of spring. I always love the first day of spring. Uh, It was a day earlier than typical. You guys know why? Yes. Uh, I know know why now. It's a leap year. It's a leap year (laughs) because it's a leap year. Exactly. And it was the earliest spring equinox since 1896. Why? Because, interesting, I had to look it up, because the year 2000 was also a leap year. Now, normally, the years divisible by 100 are not leap years unless they're divisible by 400. And 2000, therefore, was a leap year. Uh-huh. And that just also introduced, you know, a uh, um, adjusted the calendar so that the date, you know, is early. Yeah, and, and basically every four years between now and 2103 will be the earliest spring equinox. You know what I mean? It'll just keep getting slightly earlier, like by a few minutes, you know, like earlier, earlier, earlier over the next century. Like a Y2K ripple that is still <laughs> yeah. occurring yeah, yeah, yeah. through space and time. You know, not for nothing, but it, I'm pretty attuned to when things start to bloom in the spring. Like mm-hmm. I, I, by, I usually by week by week, I know like, oh, this is the week that the forsythia blooms. And things are about two weeks early, you know, than they usually are. Global warming, uh, Steve. Yeah, I, totally. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We are we're so screwed. I know, right? Like it's it's really happening. You know, like yeah. I know we had some cold days this winter, which was really nice. Well, a- every month for the last nine months was the warmest month on record. Meaning, like the November was the warmest November on record, and December was the warmest December yeah. on record. February was the warmest. February on record. Snodsberries taste like snodsberries. <laughs> well, we're losing our winter. Yeah, right. <laughs> we're, we're, we're losing our winter seasons, at least in this part of the country. Yeah, the last five winters have been very mild. Very mild. What did we have this year? Maybe maybe two snow events for the whole and nothing winter? nothing that maybe. stuck. There was very little time where there was actually snow on the ground. Whereas you go back, you know, ten years, and obviously this is all temp, you know short term trends that we're talking about here, but. Um, like this would not really have been possible thirty years ago. Yeah, but this yeah, is kind of, gosh, our no. climate right now in this part of the world is partially affected by the volcano eruption, though, mm-hmm. which puts seawater up into the upper upper atmosphere, which is uh, you know it's going to be gone in a few more years, I think. But it, it, that is factoring in as well. Mm. I was also chatting with someone in Canada of all places yesterday, and we we brought up the subject of the fires that occurred. Yeah. Last summer, and they oh, said yeah. that they're already being, they're already starting to issue some warnings that it's going to happen again this this coming summer. Oh so, boy! Yeah, that was nasty. They need to, I, you know, not that I'm a forest a forestry person, but I did read that you know they can cut swaths into the the tree lines so that yeah, you make like a grid basically yeah. Yeah, among so the it, trees, so it, so it contains it burns out one one square at a time instead of the whole thing going up. I don't know how hard that would be. I mean, I'd imagine it would be ridiculously hard with the real estate that they have up there. There's a lot of forestry up there. Oh my god! But they do logging, and you know, and and it's, it is common to do forest management. I know in Connecticut, for example, because uh, I, I looked into this because you know we we some we partly buy some of our firewood, right? So. Uh, although we, again, I haven't had to burn that much firewood this winter, right? Yeah, but you know, yeah, typically, like I would get a cord of firewood for the winter, and I did way more research than I needed to, because to, I'm just got interested in stuff like that. You go down a rabbit hole, and so essentially, <laughs> you know, the state does forest management; it cuts down a lot of trees, and then you can get a license to basically to cut up those trees for firewood, and then you could sell it. You know, essentially, the the forest management management does this. They can cut down tons and tons of trees, you know? That's not really as big a deal as it may as it may sound. Mm-hmm. Oh, you have to have it. I'm, you have or, to do or, forest management. You have to have I know forest we, management. The, you know, talking about the, the Canadian forest fires, it was a complicated situation because, yes, of course, it was global warming that sets the conditions for those kind of fires to happen. But also there's a lot of criticism that, you know, they, they weren't doing adequate forest management and that was also 
creates a problem. You know, it sets up, you know, there's too much fuel on the forest floor. It makes it a setup as well. Same thing with California. It was partly forest management, partly weather conditions, partly mismanagement of old electric electrical lines, you know, that, that were sparked, you know, and caused the fire. So we just don't have the luxury anymore to like to be negligent about that sort of thing because the result will be massive forest fires. Catastrophic. Yeah, it was, yeah. It, yes. was it was bad. Yeah, and and you know it all it all goes into the air that we all breathe, so nobody's uh, immune from those impacts. All right, we have a great interview coming up later, so I want to get right to the news items. I'm going to start with a quickie. Uh, this just dropped, and so I'm not going to go into too much detail on it. There isn't actually that much detail to give, but if you guys heard uh, of this proof of concept study where they use CRISPR to to potentially remove HIV from cells, from what? infected cells. Ooh. So wow. cool. Wow. Yeah. So not, huh? I know, because it's a virus. This is yeah. so cool. Virus. So here's the problem. Yeah, this is awesome. So here's the problem with <laughs> HIV is that, you know, it's a retrovirus. Yeah. So it inserts its DNA into the host cells, in this case, immune cells, and they can lie dormant there. So even if you get rid of all of the circulating HIV and all of the actively infected cells that are producing HIV, there's still these dormant cells with HIV in them. Um, some of the treatments uh, involve actually like coaxing the HIV out of the cells so that you could then get rid of it, you know, trying to like activate it. Um, but still, you, you, if you have HIV, you know, the human immuno, immunodeficiency virus, you're on lifetime medications because the infection's chronic. It's there. You're, you're not going to get rid of it. So here the idea is use CRISPR to go in there and snip it out, just snip it out of the cells where it's laying dormant. Now – the trick with CRISPR, of course, is getting it to the cells, right? Yeah. All the yeah. cells yes. that are infected. And so, you know, the researchers are very clear about saying this is a proof of concept. This is not a ready for the clinic treatment. And it, there are a lot of challenges ahead, a lot of work ahead to turn this proof of concept into an actual functional treatment. So this is probably going to be years. But what they basically demonstrated is that it could theoretically work, that CRISPR can eliminate HIV from an infected cell. But you know, now the trick is going to be turning that into an actual treatment strategy, like getting it to all the cells. Also, the, the, the study that we have so far, um, there was three volunteers, right, three people with HIV, after 48 weeks of treatment, they showed no serious side effects, so that's good. Of course, the biggest concern with CRISPR when you're trying to use it in an organism, right, like you're not using it in cells in a Petri dish, you're using it in a living organism, is the off-target effects, right, that it also will snip other things out of cells or target cells that you don't want it to. I hate when yeah, that so, uh But that's why they have to monitor for the long-term side effects. So. Uh, but so far, you know, after 48 weeks, you know, nothing in those three volunteers, you know, nothing cropped up. Obviously, a lot of research ahead. This is just like the earliest sort of clinical step. But yeah, this this is another way for CRISPR to be used clinically to remove viruses which have managed to insert their way into the DNA of their hosts. I hope it works out because it could be awesome. Man, I love CRISPR. Yeah. And Steve, I mean, is it too much... To ask that, like, it would be – if it works with HIV, it would work with other viruses? No, that's the idea, right? If it, if it works, it could work with potentially with any retrovirus or any virus that in, inserts its uh, its genetic material into the into the host cells, you know, potentially. Because it depends on the cells that are the target, you know. It's all about you getting the CRISPR to the cells, right? That's that's the tricky part. Right. CRISPR is good at getting to the D, the targeting the DNA, but you got to then you need a vector to target, get the CRISPR to the cells you need to get it to. And that's actually a, a trickier problem is the vector. Although we're making strides there as well, but that's the challenge for specific clinical applications. That's why, if you remember, some of the low hanging fruit uh, in terms of using CRISPR therapeutically is like in sickle cell disease, because then you could take the blood out, like, right, you could take the bone marrow out of somebody, do the CRISPR, and put it back. So that's how you target the cells, as opposed to having to target cells that are circulating within a person or targeting a specific organ or something. Right. All right. Mm -hmm. Jay, yeah. some other good news. I think this is good news. Tell us how Starship's third launch went. 
yeah, as you guys know, like we need um, this technology to to work in order to do the Artemis missions. Um, so what was it? It was on March 14th that SpaceX had its third test flight of the 400 foot tall. That's 122 meters. The Starship, right? This is the the spacecraft vehicle that they have that's all silver. It looks pretty bulletproof. So Flight 3 was known as um, Flight 3. That's what they called it. Um, <laughs> Smart. <laughs> so it involved ship number 28 and booster 10, right? So these the components that they use to build the ship are all numbered and they they've they've you know they've pre-built. I think they have four other sets that that are ready to go as well. So this is the world's most powerful rocket. Just to remind you, it, it achieved an altitude on flight three of 230 kilometers or 143 miles, um, and it launched from Boca Chica, Texas. You know where that is, Kara? Nope. No. <laughs> Texas is huge, so I'm not. It's surprised. very big. Yes. So this last flight test. Um, did demonstrate some legitimate progress from Flight 2. It achieved um, most of its predefined objectives that include uh, things like, you know, engine operation, right, because all the engines fired and they were all working uh, uh, optimally. First and second stage clean separation, controlled partial return. You know, unfortunately, the mission did conclude with the destruction of both, uh, you know, the booster and the ship during it. But, you know, it's okay. It's all right. These things explode. They learn stuff. Well, they're they're designed to explode if something goes wrong. Yeah, but I mean, it, they it went farther and did better. Yeah, um, made it to orbit. Yeah, it's great. I mean, it is it is a success. But still, you know, part of SpaceX's methodology is that they're okay with these types of things happening. Like they push it to to its limits. They want to see what it can do, and then they make modifications on the next test flight. So real quick, prior to Flight 3, um, I want to tell you guys about the first and second missions just so you get an idea of what they've been working on and what they've fixed. So SpaceX initial test flights, they had a lot of, a lot of big challenges. Uh, the first test flight dealt with engine failures. Um, and da- Remember the massive damage to the launch pad? Oh, my God. Um, yeah. That was know, intense. But putting those issues aside, um, that test flight provided the valuable data that they needed to, to make improvements both to the launch infrastructure and the vehicle design. The second test flight, uh, they introduced several upgrades that were aimed at enhancing the vehicle reliability. They improved the engine shielding, and they had more powerful fire suppression system. Remember, you, you know, because of the first launch, they had a, they had to beef up that fire suppression system to help uh, you know save the the launch platform. And despite these super expensive improvements, the flight ended in the loss of the booster again and the ship due to the engine explosion and uh, all the onboard fires. So now we get to flight three. You know, they incorporated everything they learned from the previous two flights. They included a change in the landing zone to the Indian Ocean, which was uh, put in place to help mitigate environmental impacts, which I thought was a really good choice. The flight featured advancements like the opening and closing of the payload door, which they did successfully test. They also experimented with transferring uh, fuel between two different tanks that are on the Starship. Now, this was they did this because it it mocks up or mimics spacecraft to spacecraft refueling, which is only gonna is that's the way that this ship is gonna get to to the moon and back, right? It has to be refueled once it's in orbit around Earth. So that was a, su- a success. They also made structural Wait, can enhancements. You, can can to, we pause there for a second, Jay? You're saying that the, the Starship can't go from the surface of the Earth to the moon in one go without being refueled. Yeah, that's what I understand. It has to be refueled. How come? If the yeah, Apollo could do it, I mean, the, the Saturn V, this is a bigger this rocket. This thing is gigantic, Steve. Yeah. This thing is that's, massive. And shouldn't it be able to go farther? I'm sure. I don't know. Honestly, I just don't know, Steve. I mean, I don't know how much it's burning mm. to get out, you know, to, to get into orbit. Is that is that with, more, like, much more payload than what the Saturn V could carry? I would imagine that they're they're testing it to where it would be once, you know, they, they know exactly what's going to be on it. So the weight is probably going to be what it would be with full payload I, I i agree with that i read it like it has to be it has to be refueled in orbit to then go to the moon all right I, yeah we'll, we'll have to take a look deeper into that because that does that just strikes me as a little odd yeah i can see with a smaller point. rocket like you're trying to get to the moon with a smaller rocket you'd need to refuel no it says here it uh it's critical uh for it to do this for space refueling which is essential for missions extended beyond earth's orbit so yeah it has to be refueled hmm. So they also made structural enhancements to the vehicle, which is good. You know, they beefed it up. 
though it did fail to achieve the soft water landing and they lost a ship during re-entry, re-entry the test completed several key objectives, which is, which is good. This is really good progress. We needed to have a, a nice success here. So they made updates to the launch pad and vehicles were made to improve safety and performance. They changed uh, the tank farm, which is the tanks that hold the fuel before they fuel up the, the ship itself. They, they modified engine designs. They modified the heat shield. Um, the flight was trying to achieve specific test objectives, such as conducting a payload bay door. Uh, and like I said, the cryogenic fluid transfer test, all these things, it checked out. Everything went really well up until when things started to return back to earth. There was also another idea that they were going to reignite the Raptor engines in space for the first time. And I guess this was part of the, the controlled re-entry process. It was going at about 27,000 kilometers or 16,700 miles per hour, but the engine reignition wasn't attempted, and that led eventually to the loss of the vehicle. You know, Flight 3's outcome, it's, you know, it's, it's an indication of the ongoing efforts that we're going to see with SpaceX trying to refine the Starship program. Of course, they have to do it. You know, they have to, they have to get a certain amount of the critical things 100%. And as you guys may or may not know, the FAA uh, is heavily involved in everything that's going on with the Starship testing. And they they basically help them determine what needs to be fixed for the next uh, test flight. And then they the FAA also analyzes everything that happens during the flight. So they're a part of the whole process here. They, you know, they, they help implement the, the required corrective actions. So, you know, in the end... We did take a step closer to Artemis being able to happen. I think um, we're going to see another test flight in a couple of months. And, you know, onward, man. Like, I'm just excited. I I want to see this stuff kick ass. All right. So my preliminary findings are that the main, you know, the main differences between Saturn V and Starship. What? Saturn V had a bunch of different stages. They would, right? So they would throw the stages away in order to save fuel as you go. But Starship Mm -hmm. is designed for reusability. It's only two stages, and the first oh, stage yes. has to come, has to land again to be reused. So there's a, it's just a different set of trade offs. So in order to get they, so it gets into orbit with basically no fuel, and, and in fact it ah. it takes five to ten other starships to refuel one starship to get to the moon. Oh wow! Apparently, wow. So I'm going to look into that more deeply, but that seems to be the short answer. Is that that obviously it's designed to function this way, but it was the trade off was no stages, so they so it's more reusable, which is interesting. All right, thank you, Jay. Got it. Kara, do viruses ever go extinct? They do, and one flu virus may have gone extinct. At least that is what experts are urging virus manufacturers to keep in mind as they produce the new uh, flu flu vaccine for next year. So the World Health Organization and now the CDC are saying, hey, as you produce the new flu vaccine for the next season, let's not make the quadrivalent anymore. Let's make it only protect against three different strains because one of those four, the B. Yamagata strain, we think might be extinct. We haven't seen it in several years. So this is really interesting. Apparently, COVID has helped us cause the B. Yamagata strain to go extinct. There have historically been four strains of the flu that have been covered by the quadrivalent vaccine. So if you got the flu vaccine this past year or for many years in the past, you probably got a quadrivalent vaccine. It protected against two influenza A and two influenza B, ty- uh, influenza B types. One of those types was uh, part of the Yamagata lineage. And that lineage over the past, I'd say, decade or so has been doing something really interesting as it evolved. From how I'm reading this, the clades, the sort of um, evolutionary changes to the vaccine have been getting f- further and further apart. And in doing so, it's been one of the main reasons that sometimes when we get a flu vaccine, it hasn't been very effective. Because as we know, we're often sort of predicting uh, how the flu is going to mutate over the years and um, having to estimate 
what what the flu is going to look like in advance of the coming flu season. And when we do that, sometimes our predictive powers are not very good. And what ends up happening mm. is that we will be predicting based on one subtype of one of these uh, four types within the – so a subtype of a subtype within the flu vaccine. The Yamagata subtype, the B Yamagata, has historically – had its own subtypes or the clades within it becoming like more and more uh, distinct, more and more different. And because of that, sometimes the, the vaccine has not been providing very good coverage. But because of that, something really cool seems to have happened. And that's that during COVID, as it became more and more disparate, it actually just went extinct People weren't transmitting it to one another. And, you know, we, were, we just weren't going out in public. We were maintaining social distancing. People were getting their vaccines. They were getting their COVID shots and their flu shots. And we weren't spreading viruses nearly as well. And so we first in 2021 started to notice that people weren't testing positive for this subtype of the flu. And since then, there have been no cases <laughs> that, that anybody could detect. And because there have been no detected cases since then, um, kind of across the globe, uh, experts have said, hey, we think that we can sort of reasonably say that we don't think that this subtype of the flu is in existence anymore. And we feel pretty, pretty reasonably comfortable no longer protecting for it within our um, within our vaccine formulations. And so, yeah, it looks like the guidance now for next year and manufacturers are, are kind of moving pretty quickly um, is that there it won't be within our new flu shots. Our new flu shots next year will be trivalent, not quadrivalent. No quad. Mm -hmm. No more quad. Yeah. Pretty interesting. OK. Yeah. Well, let's get that down to bivalent, you know. Right. I mean, That'd be nice. less complicated means less money means, um, you know, I think like, more accessibility, more accessible. Yeah. I mean, across the board, the fewer, obviously more is better if necessary, but less is better if, if it makes it necessary. easier to manufacture the vaccine. A hundred percent. Right. We want, we want to be as protective as possible, but not if it's unnecessary. Plus making of the vaccine cover that strain means that there has to be that strain in the lab. So it's exactly. safer to not cover the It's strain. safer, yeah. yeah. So now we're talking two influenza A's and only one influenza B strain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I always wondered, like, what lab. would it take Weird. for... Because, like, a virus is just sort of moving around the population. But, you know, how, what would it take for just it, just at one point it just doesn't infect anybody? You know what I mean? Like, this, if at any point no one's infected, the virus is gone. Right, because there's no non-human reservoir, right? Or is there a non-human reservoir? For there it? is. That's the thing. I was looking into like where these viruses live because I was kind of confused. Apparently, there are four types of influenza viruses. There's an A, B, C, and D. A and B cause the seasonal epidemics, and that's why they're in our shots. So A and B cause flu seasons in you know the U.S. A are the only ones that also cause pandemics. So A is where you see H1N1 and H3N2. And then the B lineages are B Victoria and B Yamagata. So again, now B Yamagata seems to be extinct. And then C generally causes such mild illness uh, that it doesn't even cause epidemics, so we don't even inoculate, uh, we don't even um, vaccinate against it. And then D only affects cattle, and there does seem to be spillover, but it doesn't infect people. So I'm trying to look here between Victoria and Yamagata, what they actually infect. Okay, so B only infects humans, ferrets, pigs, and seals. That's interesting. I'd have to do a little bit more digging it to see if Yamagata is extinct only in people or if it's all the way extinct because all of the coverage that I'm reading says that it is extinct extinct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But but also maybe we just don't know. How do we know if it's fully extinct right. in every seal, ferret and pig? Right. right. Yeah. But yeah, pretty interesting. Or maybe those are only in Victoria, not in Yamagata. Um so I would have to do a little bit more digging. 
But yeah, A is where we see yeah, all of yeah. those. Along those lines, I always had this crazy idea, starting mm-hmm. when my kids had lice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, couldn't we just Headlines. agree that everyone is going to shave all their hair at the same time in the world, and we'll just eliminate right. lice? Just we'll, we'll be the generation for the rest of humanity to just get rid of lice. Right? L- lice on – wait, but lice would go somewhere Well, Well, there's human oh, lice. Yeah. There's human lice that only infect humans. Only. Yeah, and and yeah, and they and they we, they need hair follicles. But follicles. would they all like? Would there be because of the environmental pressure is so heavy in that moment? Would you yeah. be bottlenecking would it them work? into mutating into dogs or yeah, something? Yeah. You know, it'd be an interesting ex- global experiment. That's for sure. I'd get very yeah. hard to get compliance. One person yeah. doesn't do it. Yeah, social, yeah right. I yeah, mean, that's what we're that's what we're basically yeah. doing with like polio. That's yeah. what we're doing. You know, I mean, right, it, right. it is, and, and we've been relatively successful with with some of these eradication efforts. But as we've talked about before, it only works when there is no non human reservoir. Yeah, right for eradication. Yeah. Yes, that's right mm-hmm, for eradication. Remember in World War Z, the, the North Koreans they pulled the, the teeth out of everybody in the country so nobody could bite each other. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's how they dealt <laughs> with that one. <laughs> wow. well, it's extreme but so was the zombie apocalypse yep. all right bob how is voyager one doing after all these years hey so is voyager one fracked what i use that word instead of what i wanted to go with but it's still works. <laughs> oh, the I oldest <laughs> the oldest and most distant probe ever launched voyager yeah. one has been transmitting gibberish for months now no data has been transmitted at all what happened? Can it be fixed? Or is this the swan song of Voyager 1 destined to drift dead in space until it becomes the all-powerful V'ger in 249 <laughs> years as prophesied by Star Trek? Yeah. Now, if you're pounding your desk right now correcting me about V'ger, then kudos to you and your Star Trek <laughs> geekiness. Voyager 6, right? Yes, all good fans know that it was fictional Voyager 6 that became V'ger in Star Trek The Motion Picture. <laughs> Okay. So, but we all remember the real Voyager 1, right? Launched in the year Star Wars. I mean, everything has got a science fiction milestone tied to it in my mind. Uh, Released when Star Wars was first released in 1977. Uh, The mission took advantage of a once in 175 year alignment of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune to use gravitational assists. Slingshot Voyager 1 throughout the solar system. Um, so after the glorious missions to Jupiter and Saturn, Voyager 1 used Saturn to arc up and out of the plane of the solar system towards the next destiny 20, in 2012 the, when it went through the heliopause where the solar system in a sense ended – where it ends because the sun's uh, solar wind and magnetic field give way to the true interstellar medium. So that was, a, that was the last you know, really big um, milestone for Voyager 1. Now it's just kind of been cruising along. In the interstellar medium, it's 15 billion miles away, 24 billion kilometers from Earth. It's been running for an amazing 47 years. That's so uh, cool. What a feat. What a feat. And, you know, it has had its share of technical difficulties all, all along, which, which have been fixed, basically, or worked around. Uh, but this latest glitch is the worst. November 2023, it started babbling in binary. Uh, Linda Spilker, Voyager project scientist at NASA's JPL, said we, we'd we gone from having a conversation with Voyager with the ones and zeros containing science data to just a dial tone. She described it as a dial tone now. Now, engineers think the culprit uh, here is corrupted memory inside one of the three onboard computer systems that Voyager 1 has. Um, the system that they're really focused in on is the flight data subsystem, FDS uh, now, FDS collects science and engineering data from the sensors, from Voyager's sensors, and then gets that ultimately to the high-gain antenna, which send, sends back all this wonderful information as radio waves, um, which it has been doing for decades um, up until last November. Now, I troubleshoot often errant computers all the time in my mild-mannered man- persona as Bob the IT guy, uh, and sometimes <laughs> – Sometimes I even have I have to get on a server uh, running Windows 2003, which is galling for me. It's like, are you kidding? 2003, how <laughs> is great. this OS still alive? But I can't even imagine troubleshooting an ancient half a century old computer system where, where all the true original experts are basically dead. But not only that, this computer is also so far away, billions of kilometers. How far away is that it? When you, 
It's, <laughs> yes. Uh, Too late. <laughs> I'll fix it that, in editing. The, the, res- <laughs> the response to me hitting the enter key takes 45 hours to get back to me. 45 yeah. hours to see you know, what the result is of my latest command or if I was troubleshooting this damn thing. For 45 hours, I don't know if, you know, if I'm going to get back nothing or good information or maybe the fact that I actually killed the entire computer because it's like, <laughs> like so fragile. You don't, they have to be so careful in interacting with it. So, um, so what caused this glitch? The theory is that a high-energy cosmic ray flipped a bit in the system's memory. That's, Ooh, what, interesting. that's what they think. So now that's happened before. It has happened before, but it's even more likely since 2012. Why do you think it's more likely now? Because it no longer has the protection of the solar system. Right. Now that it's in the interstellar medium, there's more charged cosmic rays that normally wouldn't make it past the heliosphere. Now, when they when that happened before, they would get a memory readout, right? And then that would reveal where the bad bit was. Um, so Susan Dodd, a Voyager project manager at JPL, said, we've recovered from bit flips before. The problem this time is we don't know where the bit flip is because we can't see what the memory is. It's the most serious issue we've had. So, yeah, so, so it looked bad because they just couldn't find out. They couldn't pinpoint where the problem is, assuming it even was this bit flip in the memory. Um, but there was a breakthrough of sorts March 1st, 2024, just earlier this this month, they sent a different type of troubleshooting command to Voyager, and the result was a binary stream that for the first time was different than, it, than they've been getting for months, but it wasn't in the usual format that you would expect if everything was okay working again. And regarding this, NASA said in a recent update, but an engineer with the agency's deep space network, which operates the radio antennas that communicate with both Voyager's and other spacecraft traveling to the moon and beyond, was able to decode the new signal and found out that it contains a readout of the entire uh, FDS memory. So they Holy got, moly, they got the, the, the memory dump. Now, kudos to this unnamed engineer. Uh, I will call him Miles O'Brien. Huh. Now, this, this seems to be great news to me, in my mind. Now that what they can do is they can now look through this memory dump, which they essentially have from, from this from this uh, subsystem, this uh, computer, this computer subsystem, and they could, they have the memory dump, and they can then compare it to the most previous memory dump from bu- from the before time, right before it was sending gibberish, and hopefully when they do that comparison, they can then identify the bit that flipped and then and correct it, and uh, and in the future, and then it will hopefully continue as it was until it does ultimately keel over. I mean, I heard this thing is is losing. What a few like four watts every year. It's just getting less and less powerful. Those nuclear batteries do not last forever. But but I'd much rather have it die a death of old age rather than just some corrupted memory, which would be a little frustrating. But um, but hopefully we'll have you know at least a handful five or five ten years. I'm not sure what the life expectancy is at this point. But um, hopefully we'll get some more time out of Voyager One because it has been an amazing mission. Oh my God, seventy seven. This thing launched and now it's outside of the he- the sun's influence, the heliosphere, outside our solar system, in a sense. Uh, amazing. I want it to keep going for a while. It is amazing. I never would have guessed it would be still going this, oh this much God. longer. And there was an excellent documentary on Voyager uh, produced by PBS called The Farthest. Yeah, very nice. 50, yep, 15 billion miles and counting. And it's a, it's even further than that because this was back in 2017. But it's excellent. I highly recommend it. All right, Evan, you are going to give us another installment in our series on death by pseudoscience, the exorcism edition. Yeah, uh, and it's sad that I even have to bring these up every you know, regularly, in fact. But this is this is the case when it comes to exorcisms; they they persist. You can't people per- continue this belief system. And it results in horrible, horrible consequences. So, yeah, most religions claim that humans can be possessed by demonic spirits and other entities, and they'll offer exorcisms to remedy the threat. But believing in nonsense can cause a great deal of harm, including death. And there is a true body count that accompanies belief in exorcisms. There always has been and there always will be. But the latest tragic news is about the death of a three-year-old girl at the hands of their family as she was forced to undergo an exorcism. Ugh. Oh, boy. 
Yeah, this is in California. Rene Hueso was arrested in May 2022 for the September 24th, 2021 killing of three-year-old Arlie uh, Naomi Proctor. Hueso is the leader of a, well, it's described as a backyard Pentecostal church in San Jose. The, the name is in Spanish. I, I'll, I'll embarrass myself if I try to say it, so I'll move on. Hueso is the grandfather of young Arlie, and she died as, at his hands after she was delivered by Arlie's mother. Her name is Claudia Hernandez, and uh, along with her uncle, Rene Santos. So the news is, though, this past Monday, all three family members, they're in court. They've want, they're, they're having their court date now. Uh, it's a probable cause hearing pro where prosecutors are laying out evid evidence against each of these three defendants, and the judge is going to decide if there's enough evidence now to go to trial, which we should know about by the end of this week. All three are charged with felony child abuse resulting in death. Arlie's mother was first arrested in early 2022, and then a few months later, uh, upon further investigation, they made the arrest of the other two people involved. And according to the early reports from the investigators in the case, the, mo the reason the mother brought her daughter to, uh, to him in the first place was that she thought she was being possessed because she woke up from sleeping multiple times in one night and, she, and the little girl was screaming and crying. So There you go. Brought to, yep, so brought her to the grandfather. nightmares? Yep. Have, right, or night terrors. I don't yeah. know if, I don't even know, can three-year-olds have night terrors? I'm not even sure, maybe. But but regardless, they brought her to the grandfather's church, and then they tried to force her to vomit up the demons inside her by gagging, squeezing, and choking her. Yeah. There was a coroner's report that was released that determined that Arlie died by asphyxiation, and authorities allege she was subjected to more than 12 hours of physical abuse that included being strangled multiple times to the point of unconsciousness, had fingers shoved down her throat to the point she had multiple injuries in her mouth and to her tongue, and, she had, and there was pressure placed on her body, her torso from front to back, so much force applied that she lost consciousness several times. She was also not given any food and hardly any water in the 24 hours leading up to that death. This little girl. And they, and after, after she died, or the family did, uh, took their time notifying the authorities. It was several hours afterwards before somebody decided to call somebody to try to help the girl who was not coming back from consciousness from unconsciousness. So, I don't know. I mean, shame and woe to those institutions and belief systems who really kind of turn a blind eye to these kinds of senseless deaths. They help prop it up. And I read so little about them coming out and kind of, they should be the ones to lead the way to say, stop this. You but know, this, the churches. and the, This and, sounds and those... like it's so far beyond that. This just is, this is neglect and abuse beyond some sort of religious bullshit, don't you think? I mean, mm. like they didn't, get help <laughs> you know like you said they didn't call for help even after I, you're right it's it's almost hard to c categorize exactly what this yeah is. it's two yeah. things it's first of all it is obviously contributed to by the religious belief in mm. demonic possession which is barbaric medieval right but mm. also even in that context there was abuse there there was mm -hmm. neglect and 100%. abuse because there's always yeah. – obviously there's a duty to take care of a helpless child, not to yes. be the agent of direct harm. Even if you think they need an exorcism, the number one priority should be to protect the child. So it was absolutely neglect and abuse. They tortured and killed mm -hmm. that girl basically. Yeah. E That's yeah. Exactly Even if in happens, the moment yeah. they thought they were helping, when they realized she's not breathing, they didn't call for medical attention. Mm -hmm. Like that's that's a problem. Yeah, there's. You're right. It's mm -hmm. it's a symptom of something something deeper, mm -hmm. perhaps than uh, than solely the religious aspects. Yeah. And I'm this. sure that they're claiming religious freedom in terms of their defense, or, or are they oh, or they gosh. or did they plead that's not guilty awful. or guilty? Again, this was a probable cause hearing where a judge is deciding if there's enough evidence to go to trial. So I don't know if there is a plea involved at this stage of this part of the case. Defense attorney says that 
the cross-examination has only begun. Uh, They were attempting to establish that defendants had no homicidal intent and were only trying to help the girl via exorcism because this is what they know. It's still manslaughter. Like this is their this yeah. is their culture. This is the, right there. Doesn't this matter. Is, this would have been their reaction to anyone similar in a, in a similar situation. This is exactly how they would have reacted, no matter who it was. Yeah. Of course, Seems that's going to be the defense strategy. Yeah. But I, it's it's good to hear that this is being fully prosecuted. You know what I mean? That mm-hmm. like the state is bringing charges against these parents, and it sounds like pretty strong charges. What do you know? What they're actually you said this is like a, a hearing to determine what charges should be brought? Felony child abuse resulting in death. Yeah, so child, it's child abuse. It's not charge. murder. Good. That's, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, that's that's good to hear that they're coming out, you know, kicking. Yeah, good yes. for them. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah, like setting those kinds of precedences. Important. And it also picked up national attention. It's not just a local San Jose story. Right. This, is, uh, this, is, this is picked up by NBC and, and all the national outlets have been carrying this. All right. Thank yeah. you, Evan. I know it's a, it's yep. a terrible thing to have to report, but, it's, you know. Yeah, I know. I, I do but, think it's know, important it to talk about to it. Yeah. Well, everyone, we're going to take a quick break from our show to talk about our sponsor this week, Factor Meals. Yeah, eating better is easy with Factor. They've got delicious, ready-to-eat meals. They are fresh and never frozen, prepared by chefs and ready to go in just two minutes. You're talking over 35 different options to choose from every week and more than 60 add-ons to help you stay full and ready to go. Factor meals, guys, they're totally convenient, right? The first night I tried one of the meals, it was like after six. I remember I was like, did not want to cook, you know, like pretty much every night. And I loved it. And I tried all six of the dinners that I, you know, I ordered six and I got got them and had them all and they were all great. So head to factormeals.com slash SGU50 and use code SGU50 to get 50% off. That's code SGU50 at factormeals.com slash SGU50 to get 50% off. All right, guys, let's get back to the show. All right, guys, are you you aware that there's been a recent spike in demand for electricity in the United States? Yes. Uh, Yes. (laughs) Is this for AI? Are you aware? We're going to get to that in a second. Are you aware that for like the last (laughs) 20 years electricity demand has been relatively flat. Uh, I wouldn't have guessed that. Yeah, you wouldn't have guessed that, right? But it has been. I mean, it bounces up and down, but it really hasn't changed much for 20 years. And the reason for that is that, you know, even though we're doing more stuff, you know, with electricity and population is growing, there it's been offset by efficiency. LED bulbs uh, were huge, right? Going from right. Yeah. over the last 20 years. Love my LED bulbs. You know, love the them. more energy efficient appliances. And, you know, we basically went from homes not being uh, weatherized to being being more energy efficient, going to double pane glass and, you know, better mm-hmm. insulation, better standards. So all of those things have contributed to a dramatic decrease in energy waste. And that has pretty much offset the increase in demand for for electricity, for, for doing stuff with electricity. But in the last year or two, there has been a spike. When you look at the graph, your first reaction is, really? Are they really extrapolating from that tiny little you know, upturn? Like, it's, isn't it too early to tell? But when you read deeper... You find that though it's not just they're not just extrapolating the trend over the last year. They're taking into account things that have already that are already underway. You know what I mean? Like they they know like these factories are being built and this is happening and that's happening and therefore they're projecting de- you know demand into the future. Not just it's not numerology, right? They're not just extending a graph out. They're they're an- analyzing industries to determine what the likely future demand for electricity is. So there are four things that are the main drivers of this increase in electricity demand and this increase in the future projections of demand. What do you think those are? Uh, Digital currencies. Crypto? Yeah, so we'll we'll, we'll combine those into data centers, right? So, yeah, so data centers, so AI, crypto, just increasing everything digital. So data centers are are cropping up, they're proliferating, and they use a ton of electricity. Mm -hmm. They're also a lot faster to build than the, than 
the power to power them is to build, right? right. All right, that's one. What else? Electric cars. Electric vehicles, right? Okay. Right now, the United States, we're only at about 1% of cars on the road being all electric. But Really? Yeah, but um, 9% Last year, in 2023, 9% of new car sales were all electric. And in the last wow. quarter, it was 17%. So, so obviously... Wow. That's a trend. Up. Yeah, so that, that's trending up fairly quickly. And, and prices for EVs are plummeted. They're really coming down almost to parity with similar ICE vehicles, you know, internal combustion engine vehicles. So there's every expectation. Now that like we're over the pandemic and the supply lane, the supply line crunch and all that stuff, the prices are coming down. Demand is going to you know, go back up again. So this is, again, they're projecting out you know, the fairly you know, dramatic increase in EVs going forward. That's it. And as we've been saying, we have to account for that when we're figuring out like how much electricity we're going to need. Two other things. Um, I would maybe think like uh, grow farms for marijuana. N- no, that was not mentioned as one of the factors. That may be a factor, but it's not enough to to be, be on the radar here. Not top four. What about top like four. A- other battery technologies so we'll broaden that out to just industry so there's we are okay. onshoring a lot of industry that was previously you know uh, uh, that was being done elsewhere in the world right so as we bring back mm-hmm. industry we have to power those industries mm-hmm. like manufacturing right so we're onshoring a lot mm-hmm. of manufacturing so that's a huge one and the fourth one i'll just tell you is increasing use of air conditioning because of global warming Oh, uh, that makes sense. Dye, yeah. yeah, which sucks because then there's this like it's a feedback. feedback loop. That's a feedback because it's one of the biggest contributors yeah. to global warming. Right, yeah. right, and yeah, I think most residential electricity is used for air conditioning, you know, heating and air yeah. conditioning. So the people who do this sort of analysis have had to revise their projections uh, over the next you know five to ten years as to what our likely increase in electricity demand will be. And they've essentially doubled the projected increase in demand based upon oh these recent trends. Of course, you know, things can change. We don't know if this is going to be the case, but it seems like it's going to be worse than we thought in terms of future energy demand. Mm-hmm. Now, this is a huge problem for a number of reasons, right? Uh, we're we're right. talking about like how, what's the best strategy for converting our energy infrastructure over to low carbon, right? So we're talking about wind, solar, geothermal, nuclear, and hydroelectric, right? We, we want to get as much of our energy production over to those low carbon sources as possible. We want to shut down coal as fast as possible, and then eventually natural gas and oil, and, and burn as little fossil fuel as possible, right? This is now massively frustrating that plan because as you know the this demand is really taking you know states and utilities by surprise a little bit it's like they're now sort of struggling to keep up with demand so what's the quickest uh, what's the yeah. quickest new uh, uh power plants they could bring online it's the ones that are easy Not, to build or proven yeah. technology it's coal it's, right it's, coal well natural gas so oh, okay I, but because uh, you're not going to build new coal-fired plants not in the u.s uh, do they have to frack for that? Yeah, they probably do to keep up with demand. Yeah, yeah. but mm-hmm. uh, but but natural gas is now so now a lot of utility companies are building natural gas in order to meet this immediate spike in demand. Oh my god! But not only that, they are delaying the closing of coal fire plants. So they may not uh, be building oh, new so ones, doubly. but they're delaying their closing. Yeah, we're so screwed. Yeah. yeah. So oh boy. So we're just not hitting any targets. That this changes cool. the calculus. Oh, this is yeah. we're, we're we're so far off our targets. Yeah. Remember, we talked about the fact that 2023 had the biggest fossil fuel use in history, right? And the, <laughs> cool. this, right. despite the fact that we're dramatically increasing our renewable energy profile, it, that's just meeting the new demand, right? It's <laughs> that's not eating into existing demand, and now that's this is going to be even more true. Or yep. in fact, we'll have to grow our fossil fuel repertoire in order to meet to grow the the supply fast enough to meet this spike in demand 
increasing renewable energies is not good in and of itself. It's only good if we're decreasing yeah, right, exactly. fossil fuel. Exactly. <laughs> like, you know, we're just using right. more energy. It's Burn not a more good coal thing. So we can make more solar panels? <laughs> yeah. what? The real goal is decreasing our fossil fuel use, but yeah, we're not yeah. doing that. We're just in making more energy. And that it's better than not having the new energy be of renewable, course. but it's of still course. not decreasing our fossil fuel use. So what are the roadblocks? What's the holdup in terms of expanding renewables fast enough to meet this increasing demand. People who don't believe in climate change? Well, I mean, that, <laughs> right, may, that exactly. may be contributing to it, but there are, there are real technical limitations. Big one, probably the biggest one, is the grid. It's, it takes a long mm. time to, to uh, build grid expansion projects, and they're slowed by a lot of red tape, and there's no federal agency that has the power to make it happen. And so utility companies in different states basically fight with each other over who's going to pay for what. And you know what I mean? So it's, mm -hmm. it really slows the process down. Uh, and we essentially can't do it fast enough, uh, you know, both, both technically and because of the, the regulations. So, of course, that means on the flip side that we could dramatically accelerate building more electricity grid if we funded more of it. So there is funding for it in the infrastructure bill, and that's good, but it's not enough, right? But we also need federal regulation that basically streamlines the process of applying for new grid installments and also new connections to the grid. I mentioned on a previous episode that applications for new connections to the grid can be delayed for five to 10 years. So even Whoa. if you can stand up like a wind a turbine a project or a solar a grid solar project, you might be waiting ten years to get it hooked up to the grid or to get to be to have the grid installed so that the lines put in place so that you could send that energy to the city that you're hoping to sell power to. You know, so it's just really slow. So I mean, is cutting this red tape a priority for anybody who could actually make a difference? I mean, I hear a little bit of noise being made about it, but I haven't heard like any major legislative initiative to. Oh, like, oh, we need to like radically change, you know, the regulations. The same is true for nuclear, you know, so nuclear power, the construction time is, you know, five to six years and probably could be a lot less, especially as the industry moves to small modular reactors. The whole idea is to bring down the startup cost and time. But, it, but the regulations can take a decade, a decade of just yeah, applications yeah. and pre-applications and, or more and, and cost millions of dollars. It, it just, you know, but I saw in for one particular nuclear power plant, the application, the application was two million pages. That's how long the application was. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. So, Page one, enter your Yeah. Here. So, I mean, there, it, and yeah, I've read a lot of articles about this. A lot of people who are, who are outlining the fact that there's a lot of uh, efficiency to be gained without sacrificing safety. So the American nuclear power apparently is like among the safest in the world. But if the trade-off is that takes a decade to get through the regulations. So we need to find that compromise. And, and we probably don't have to compromise on safety. I, I liken it to Operation okay. Warp Speed, right, where you took a five-year approval process and we did it in nine months. And how did that happen? It was not because of of funding uh, because companies that didn't even accept government funding were able to do it too. It's because the FDA said, this is how we could make this happen fast. We do all these things concurrently. So you don't have to wait to start phase two until you get phase one approval. You can do all these things at the same time. And like, for example, but also it might be, it might require funding for more people to do the process, right? So you're not like just waiting for, Somebody to, whose time to be freed up for three years, you know, while you're on the stack of, you know, applications that need that somebody needs to go through. So I do wonder how short we could get that time down to. Like, could we really stand up small modular reactors as fast as we stand up new data centers to basically power them? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the same is true for hydroelectric. It's also a huge uh, environmental, you know, studies have to be done. There's a huge, you know, delay because of red tape. So it's not just not just nuclear. You know, even given the, you know, the, all the good that the Inflation Reduction Act did in terms of investment and, you know, uh, in, industry incentives for, for zero carbon energy, it, you know, this spike in demand is a problem. 
and it's not going to we're not going to really be able to stay stick to our timeline of like decarbonization by 2050 without some massive legislative overhaul and a lot more investment in infrastructure and you know so we're moving backwards right now we're, you know we're build, we're building more fossil fuel and keeping our coal fire plants open to meet the spike in demand and that's bad it's very yeah all right sorry to end on a bummer but uh <laughs> but there it is cool. jay it's Who's That Noisy Time. All right, guys. Last week, I played this noisy. Any of you guys like to guess? A fan. All right. Well, we had a listener named Joe Jennings write in and said, uh, first time trying, but this week's noisy reminds me of a sound of a particular ventilator we had in our ICU for a couple of patients in the early 2000s. Uh, the device's use was uh, with adult patients soon to be found to be not efficacious, so it is no longer used in our ICU. The machine was a high-frequency oscillator ventilator. So I I tried to find this, but I couldn't find it. I wanted to hear what that sounded like, but that is definitely not it. Uh, but that's an interesting guess. A listener named uh, Selena Goubert said, Hello, is this the sound of a paper jogger? Love the segment and the show. All right, so what is a paper jogger? Well, I didn't know when I looked it up. Do any of you guys know what it is? Mm-mm. No. So there are machines where you could put in reams of paper that are kind of, you know, not lined up with each other. You know, like if you have sheets of paper that are stacked. Almost like a card. Yeah. Yeah. And it it shakes them and it lines them up. It takes a little while, but it lines them up. Um, These machines come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, I did listen to a couple of them. And they're basically like a, a vibrating table. That's basically it. So... Uh, but that was a, a good guess, but that is not correct. John Pedraza wrote in, said, greetings from Kosovo. My guest, my guess is a wow. paint mixer shaking a can of paint. Ah. Keep up the great oh, work. Yeah, that's a good one. Bad. Yeah, it, it's not that, but and I've heard that many, many, many times. I would think that the the oscillation in a paint mixer is much faster than this sound, um, but that is not correct. Um, I have another listener here that wrote in and said, uh, this is Michael Blaney, and he said, Hi, Jay, it sounds to me like a very poorly tuned motorcycle. It sounds almost identical to our neighbor's grunter that he liked to warm up and go for rides on about 6 a.m. on Saturday morning. Oh, my God. That's annoying. <laughs> <laughs> that is not correct. So nobody guessed it. I'm not surprised. This is a tough one. So the person who set the, sent this in, Brett Newton, said, uh, I look forward to seeing you and a crew in Dallas. So we're going to see this guy yes. in Dallas. He said, this is a video I took a couple of years ago documenting my friend Richard Bobo's first ever day where he his prototype sub contra bassoon was playable. Hmm. The note in question is A minus 1, negative 1, dash A0. I don't know what any of this means. Being the lowest note on the majority of pianos. Uh, the negative indicates that it is a full octave lower. This means that the sub contra bassoon shown here in the is the lowest woodwind instrument ever created, and this is one of the lowest notes capable. Okay, so let's just hear it again. So this is a oh, wind wow. instrument. The guy's blowing into this, and you can hear it. I left the sound of him breathing in the beginning to give you a little, you know, help. I'm not sure uh, why you no would way. need an instrument. I would never guess that. <laughs> right? I know. No chance. That is not very musical. <laughs> it, I know it's right? more of a it's more of a percussion <laughs> instrument than anything. But thank you uh, so much. I thought that was interesting. You know, there's there's very. people out there, you know, making musical instruments all the time. There's so many musical instruments that you don't know about, and this was one of them. So I got a new noisy this week. This was sent in by a listener named Gordon Dempsey. Check this out. This is a tough one. If you think you know what this is, or if you heard a cool noise this week, you got to email me at WTN at the skeptics org. Steve, we have lots of stuff happening and I'm oh, going to yeah. tell you all about it. All right. Mm. So we have two private shows happening in Dallas. They're both happening on April 7th. Okay. This is in the heart of Dallas in a hotel. Um, 
one of those two shows still has tickets available, and that is the 12 noon show. And you can go to the skepticsguide.org to find more information about how to buy tickets for that. Now, on April 6th, I know it's the day before and I didn't go in order, but I'm just, you know, I'm getting through this. Give me a break. April 6th, we have an extravaganza. If you don't know what this show is, this is our stage show. This show is about how your brain can fool you, how you can't trust your own perception on reality, and we prove it to you throughout the show. Basically Um, by humiliating each other. Yeah, we humiliate each other. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of improv uh, bits that we do uh, where George is basically making us do funny stuff, and then we teach you about things, and then more funny and weird stuff. There is a lot of great moments in this show. We've... You know, we refined the hell out of this show over the last six or seven years. So if you're available, this is in Dallas. It's on April 6th, and you can find information for tickets on theskepticsguide.org. All right. Now, we also have a show, two shows actually, that are going to be happening in August, and they're going to be in Chicago. So we're going to have an extravaganza, and we're going to have an SGU private show. Now, this SGU private show, It's very likely that that show will be on August 18th. I mean, there's a slight possibility that we might move the date to earlier in the day on the 17th, but there's plenty of time to work all the details out. Uh, We are shooting for the 18th. This will be our 1,000th episode. Ooh, we made it. Yep. So this is a (laughs) five-hour show. Not yet. (laughs) Five hours. Yes. Five hours. It's five hours. We're going to be- um, What are we going to talk about for five hours? Well, there's (laughs) lots of things that are going to be happening during this show. One- 200 episodes an hour. We're going to be definitely talking about our experience doing doing this show for the last 20 years. We're going to be talking about some of the best moments, some of the funniest moments. We're going (laughs) to talk about- George is going to be interviewing us. He's going to be asking us personal questions. He's going to ask the audience to ask us questions. There's going to be a trivia. There's going to be tons of, of, of interviews of people that have been on the show, like frequent guests, friends, and just interesting interviews that we've had. I'm, I'm starting to line those up right now. It is a gigantic celebration of the fact that we reached this incredible you know, round number milestone. I think a thousand is just an incredible number of episodes. Like the amount of time that we put in each week to pull this show off multiplied by 1000. You know what I mean? It's just unreal that we've been doing this for 20 years. Anyway, we would really love for you to join us. It's all going to be happening in Chicago. This is a city that we've never been to for the SGU. We're really excited to go. So please do go to our website. You can find a link on there again, where all the other buttons are to find more information about this show. The extravaganza um, tickets are also selling right now, and I think there are still some VIP tickets left, but they they might be sold out. All right. Thank you, Jay. Uh, One quick email from last week. So we had a lot of fun talking about that survey where, you know, 8% of men said they could beat a line in unarmed combat. (laughs) (laughs) I like how you said men because I don't think that was specified. No, it was. was. The survey did specify it was men. (laughs) I was going to say that's a safe assumption. (laughs) Not just men, but manly men. (laughs) Manly men. (laughs) We had a lot of of feedback on that. Uh, A lot of people, I think, enjoyed that segment. But two of note, one, a guy (laughs) linked us to a video of an interview with an MMA expert who also apparently has expertise in animal fighting. (laughs) <laughs> mainly animals fighting other animals but it was just it, it was funny to listen to him talk basically re- reiterating a lot of the stuff that we said like he basically said like a gorilla can weigh you know 400 pounds it could lift 2000 pounds and you could take the strongest man and the best fighter to have ever lived and he would just rip him to shreds like yeah. with no effort like no. it's so not a contest it's unbelievable all right but the other one that was interesting <laughs> is that uh, we got an email to a, this is a 2019 news story about a man who beat a mountain lion in unarmed Mm -hmm. combat. This does not surprise me. Mountain lions are not African lions. Yeah, but it gets even better, Kara. It was a juvenile mountain lion. Right. They think that weighed between 20 and 60 pounds. Oh, my God. It's like a big dog. No, I mean they're not. They're still brutal. Don't I would not want forty. To. It probably weighed forty pounds. And I, I still think it could kill me. I just, oh totally. I don't fight now this out. guy fought it for ten minutes. It scratched him up. Wow. Like it did a lot of damage, but he eventually mm-hmm. was able to choke it out. And right. and that's how Holy that's moly. how he killed it. 
But yeah, so yeah, that's like an edge case, right? A 40 pound right. juvenile mountain lion, you know, that's not a 200, 300 pound African lion. Yeah. And that's the thing. Just because they both have the word lion in their name, they're not the same <laughs> species. <laughs> but I think even right. still, like, like if, dandelion. Exactly. Oh, run. <laughs> a, a fully adult um, mountain lion, I think yeah. most people would be hard pressed to survive an encounter yes. with that. But that's not what I'm they were afra- asking I'm in of, the survey. Yeah, <laughs> I'm afraid of the bobcat animal. that roams around. Oh yeah, the I don't want to go near that. These thing. things are don't. predators. They, but you probably could take it, but don't. yeah, they evolved and they are they their life experience is killing other things. You know, right? Yes. Yeah, you are in their environment. Yeah, right. When you're, when I'm you're afraid of some of my friends' house cats. <laughs> <laughs> like I didn't, I wouldn't want to mess with them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I thought that was funny, but anyway. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, we have a great interview, so let's go to that interview now. We are joined now by Dr. Dante Loretta. Dante, welcome to the Skeptic's Guide. Thank you. It's great to be here. And you are the principal investigator on NASA's OSIRIS-REx asteroid sample return mission and a uh, professor in the Department of Planetary Sciences at the University of Arizona. Uh, So we're excited to talk to you about OSIRIS-REx and your other work. So tell us first, just give us an overview of the mission and how did the sample return go? OSIRIS-REx is a NASA mission which visited near-Earth asteroid Bennu. We arrived there in December of 2018, sent the spacecraft down to collect a sample in October of 2020, and successfully delivered that material to the surface of the Earth last September in 2023. It's been an amazing adventure, and I can tell you the science is just getting started because we've cracked into that sample capsule and we've delivered material to laboratories all around the world. Yeah, it's really exciting. But I have to ask, though, is so as somebody who was obviously intimately involved with this, like how certain was it that the material was going to come back? Or was that basically a coin flip? Like how, how anxious were you that you were going to actually get stuff back? Well, you have to ask the, as a function of time, right? Because the, <laughs> when we first started it, it seemed like magic. When we were designing the mission, I couldn't believe such a thing was even possible. And then as we got into the design and we reduced the risk and we really got rigorous about how we're going to approach this challenge, technically we launched with a 99% chance of mission success. That's an engineering term. I was, of course, biting my nails the entire way, especially during collection of the sample because we didn't know how the asteroid surface was going to respond. Uh, And then those critical moments last September when that parachute system had to deploy because we could have lost the whole program in those final minutes. Yeah, it's hard. You know, for any NASA mission, it's hard to say 99%. I mean, I don't think their history matches <laughs> that confidence. That's it's right. It's tough. It's hard. It's, it's hard. You know, they've, they've crashed stuff on Mars. Well, it's something like half the probes to Mars have crashed. I mean, they're, they're, they do fantastic things. But wow, 99%, that was pretty confident. That's a, Like I said, that's an engineering requirement. We have to show 99% probability of meeting our requirements. What you can't do is put those requirements on the asteroid. And, and we, in fact, did that. And, and the asteroid threw a ton of curveballs at us. In some cases, literally threw curveballs at us. Particles were flying <laughs> off the surface. Yeah, I was reading about, um, correct me, where I get this wrong, but the, you know, the vehicle kind of barely touched down and then it, it shot like, you know, some type of gas to lift up the regolith so it could be captured, right? Yeah, I like to compare it to a leaf blower. Basically, we blew down ah. gas into the surface and kicked up a bunch of dust and gravel. We had a uh, cylindrical sample collector, basically an air filter, and we just shoved as many rocks and pebbles into that as the gas would allow. Now, was there a particular reason why you targeted Bennu? Was it because you thought it was it, the asteroid itself was a good target or just because it was a, a, a opportunistic. It was just you were able to get to it. It was a combination of both. We were limited in where we could go in the solar system based on the capabilities of the of the spacecraft. We knew we were going to have to target a near Earth asteroid. That's a smaller population compared to what's in the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. And those objects are generally a lot more accessible. And particularly, Bennu has a very Earth like orbit. It's on a low inclination, relatively small eccentricity and in fact crosses the orbit of the Earth. But science got to play a role here too. And the mission, for me especially, is driven by the origins investigation. We really want to understand how asteroids like Bennu may have contributed to Earth being a habitable world, 
in terms of delivering the water that's in our oceans and the air that we breathe, and maybe even the organic molecules that trigger the origin of life on this planet. Bennu is one of the few dark, carbon-rich asteroids in the near-Earth population. All right. So it did have features that made it a good target. Plus, it was also one of the accessible ones. Correct. So yeah, it had both those features. And yeah, that, so this gets to like my next question is, you know, do you, is it the thinking that Bennu is a good uh, like frozen sample of the very early solar system? And also, is it you kind of answered this question already, but can you talk more about the fact that it's the kind of asteroid that probably contributed contributed a lot of material to the early Earth? Yeah, Bennu stands out in the asteroid population because its surface is really dark. It reflects on average about four and a half percent of the sunlight. It's like coal or asphalt. Yeah, and that was wow. one of our first clues that it might be really rich in carbon. When we look in the main asteroid belt, which is between Mars and Jupiter, we see those dark asteroids are a lot more abundant the farther out you go. And so we think Bennu may have originated from a much larger asteroid, possibly accreted out beyond Jupiter, in which case in the early solar system, four and a half billion years ago, it would have picked up not only the rocks and dust and metal that's in the inner solar system, but ices, tars that would be stable that far out. And somehow that material had to migrate into the inner solar system, delivering those critical compounds to the terrestrial planets pretty early in the process of planet formation. So why would that kind of material be more common in the outer solar system than the inner solar system? It's a temperature gradient. So in the early solar system, we were a protoplanetary disk. There was material falling and collapsing from a giant molecular cloud that was spinning due to conservation of angular momentum. Most of the material went in to form the sun at the center, but a lot of material was spread out orbiting around that center of gravity. It's really hot close to the sun. And as you get farther away, it gets colder and colder. And that's when ices will become stable and also the organic material. And when it's just like a comet, when it comes into the inner solar system, it starts to sublimate and outgas. And eventually, if it sticks around, it just disappears. So that, why is Bennu still around? Do you think it fairly recently migrated to the inner solar system? We do. We estimate Bennu migrated into the inner solar system about 1.75 million years ago. And that's based on tiny craters that we saw shot throughout the b boulders on its surface. And we know the population of dust in the inner solar system, and we can use those little micro craters to estimate how long at least those boulder surfaces had been exposed in near Earth space. But Ben is able to hang on to the water because it's no longer in the form of ice. That ice melted and reacted with the rocky material forming clays. And clays lock water right into their crystal structure, and they're stable at much higher temperatures than water ice is. So it's a natural way to deliver water that had to condense as icy material in the outer solar system. That object melted, clay minerals formed, and the clays are capable of surviving even in the intense heat of the inner solar system. Now, is that something you knew before you had the sample return? Is that something you learned because of the sample return? It's what we hoped based on the selection of Bennu and comparison to very rare types of meteorites that show these clay minerals as well. So we, that was the goal, that we were targeting an object with that kind of mineralogy. And I'm very happy to report that we were right and we got exactly the kind of sample we were hoping for. So let's talk about that. What, what You said your, the science of the sample uh, examination is just starting, but what have you learned so far? We've got a pretty good sense of the major mineralogy. In addition to those clays, we're seeing iron sulfides, iron oxides, calcium carbonates, and also phosphates. And the phosphates for me are one of the most exciting minerals or phases that we found because I'm an astrobiologist. I'm interested in the elements and the molecules that may have contributed to the origin of life. And I think a lot of information is in, in the phosphorus chemistry because it makes up, for example, the backbone of our DNA. It's used as the major energy molecule in all life on Earth. It forms the cell membranes. And also, once you get to more advanced organisms, bones and teeth. Is it possible that there are any amino acids in the sample return from Bennu or on Bennu at all? Absolutely. And that's one of our key measurement objectives. We reported some early results just last week at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference. It does contain amino acids. They look really compelling. Uh, for the listeners, amino acids are the building blocks of our proteins. 
So we're really excited to recognize that these carbon-rich asteroids may have brought the exact kinds of molecules that are used extensively in biochemistry today. We call that the exogenous delivery hypothesis. And it gives us hope that not only did Earth get all that material, but everything else in the solar system did too. Venus, Mars, the satellites of Jupiter and Saturn. Yeah, Europa. Yeah, yeah. and we don't know how the origin of life occurred, but we do now have some confidence that at least those other places had a shot at it making the search for organisms on those locations really exciting. Now, you're going to have to explain this, but what was the chirality of those amino acids? Uh -huh. The chirality is still under investigation, so we okay. don't have a definitive answer on that, but it is a really important measurement because when we look at the proteins in all life on Earth, they use what's called the left-handed version of an amino acid. If you form these chemicals through a non-biological process, they have two mirrored structures, a right-handed version and a left-handed version. Somehow life is only selecting the left-handed ones to build the proteins with. And we do have evidence of small left-handed excesses in the amino acids, but we're not confident enough in that result right now. We really need to go in with more sample mass, higher sensitivity to definitively answer that question, but it is one of our top science objectives. Yeah, but it sounds like you would predict that they would be both right and left-handed amino acids, but maybe a little bit of an excess of left-handed, and that's why life ended up using left-handed amino acids. I would definitely predict that when you form amino acids through a, a geochemical process, maybe in the hot fluids that we think form these clay minerals, you should produce equal amounts of left and right-handed versions. And then the question is, how does nature select one over the other? One idea, and I mentioned the sulfide and oxide minerals earlier, is that those mineral surfaces can have some chiral properties of their own, and they may preferentially absorb the left-handed over the right-handed and, and allow you at least locally to concentrate one version over the other. And that's an area also of active investigation right now. That reminds me of the, the matter-antimatter mystery <laughs> yeah. in the universe. Like, why is there matter and so little antimatter. Yeah, right? It's kind of interesting when you start to break these symmetries, right? A lot of our laws of physics, chemistry rely on symmetry, but the universe wouldn't exist if everything was perfectly symmetrical. Everything, matter and antimatter would wipe itself out. Left and right-handed amino acids don't build peptides and protein chains. So something is driving the system to one version of that material. Were you guys able to accurately predict what the regolith was going to contain? We were. Yeah, we have a nice sample analysis plan. I posted it several months ago on archive.org. People are really interested. It's about 300 pages long. And we predicted clay minerals. We predicted iron oxide minerals. We predicted sulfide minerals, carbonates. We did not predict the phosphorus bearing phase. That's one of the biggest surprises so far. So getting back to the, the amino acids, because it's interesting that you, that you say that there's a lot of clays there, like water containing clays. Isn't there a hypothesis that like one of the potential pathways to the origin of the first oh, biological right. molecules on Earth was that clays formed like a template that allowed like either amino acids or RNAs to form? Are you familiar with that? Absolutely. And even if all of that had happened on Earth, we still are going to gain a lot of knowledge from these Bennu samples because the environments where these clay minerals form terrestrially are at these hydrothermal vents on the ocean floor, Ooh. particularly the white smokers or what we call the alkaline hydrothermal vents. That heated water is being driven by formation of clay minerals, a process we call serpentinization. It's an mm -hmm. exothermic chemical reaction. So it releases heat, heats that water up, it's the carbonate minerals that are white, which is why they look like white smokers. We try to understand, even today, where these environments exist, could this have been a site for the origin of life? But we can't answer that question on Earth because there's all kinds of organisms that live down there. So if you find amino acids, well, you're like, yeah, it probably came from that bacteria, <laughs> right? So, yeah. Yeah. But now, if Bennu had that same geologic environment, presumably without life present. So we could see exactly what you were talking about. How do these clay minerals catalyze formation of these interesting molecules, maybe isolate them in voids and pockets, leading to some kind of catalytic system, which we think is one of the hallmarks of life. Yeah, some kind of prebiotic chemistry going on there. Exactly. And we don't have to worry about all this pesky terrestrial life contaminating our Contaminating it, right. 
Right. So you, you mentioned that the, the amount of phosphates was a bit of a surprise. Any other big surprises so far, or is there potential for any surprises that for analyses you haven't completed yet? Potential. There's always potential for surprises. And I think the organic molecular diversity is turning out to be pretty astonishing. We're seeing tens of thousands of different molecules as we go through kind of sweeping on a mass spectrometer and just looking at all the different total masses that are there. And you start to say, how are we ever going to sort all that out? And the good news is we don't have to do all that because these samples are going to be around for decades. We'll kind of start the process, but in just a few short months, any qualified researcher around the world is going to be able to request this material for analysis in their laboratories and maybe focus on a subset of that amazing organic diversity. I would think that there wouldn't be so much organic diversity on, you know, on something that doesn't have an atmosphere and flowing water and, you know, like where, where is it coming from? Good question. Now, I think one um, area of that question that's interesting to focus on is there probably was liquid water on Bennu's parent body. And, and that's an important concept yeah. to get across. So Bennu's a pretty small asteroid, about 500 meters in diameter. That would not sustain liquid water. There's simply not enough pressure inside of it. But it's a fragment or a series of fragments, what we call a rubble pile from a much larger body that was catastrophically shattered maybe a billion years ago in the main asteroid belt. And Bennu's just one of thousands of fragments from that collision. And so that body may, in fact, have had liquid water, kind of the hydrothermal system like we see at the bottom of the ocean today. Do you think Bennu is the, the fragment that is Bennu was a superficial fragment or a deep fragment? And does it matter? I think it was probably both because you mix that whole object up when you shattered it. Think about like, you know, breaking up a pool rack. The balls go everywhere and you don't know which one's going to end up next to, to the other. When we simulate these collisions, you can easily mix surface material with deep interior material. Oh, and wow. the boulders on Bennu kind of give us a clue that that might be the case because we have several different populations. Some are really, really dark, like less than 3%. Some of them are much brighter, 5, 6, 7, 8%. Some rare phases up to 30%. And we see layering like sedimentary strata in those boulders that look like maybe you had slow deposition of material at the bottom of a, a liquid water setting. Well, how are the pieces sticking together? If, it, if it, the bigger chunk was destroyed, I mean, it's not, it's, I mean, Benny was what, 500 meters, you said? I mean, there's no gravity really going on there. So did it just, just the impact had such velocity that it's kind of glommed together into different chunks or? There's just gravity? enough gravity to pull all that and hold it together. Uh, there's just, it's five micro G's is the acceleration of the surface. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. And what really surprised us was we thought that you, we had the same question. How is this thing being held together? And we assumed there must be some sort of chemical cohesion between yeah. the grains. Even a Van der Waals force would be strong. Yeah, right. So like a gecko. Exactly. And then we made contact with the asteroid and there was no resistance to the downward motion of the spacecraft. We sunk in over 50 centimeters deep astonishingly deep compared to all of the tests and most of the simulations we had run. And I honestly believe if we hadn't fired the back away engines, we would have lost it. It would have disappeared like into a pool of quicksand. Wow. So with the success of OSIRIS-REx, are there plans for further asteroid material return? There are a couple missions in the works right now. The Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, which has flown two successful asteroid sample return missions, is currently working on the Martian Moon Explorer, or MMX mission, which is targeting Phobos, the small moon of Mars, which may be a captured asteroid. Mm -hmm. I'm working with some colleagues in, on a concept to try to deliver material from the surface of a comet, which I think is the next most challenging target. Small body, much more rich in ice even than Bennu's precursor, we think and would contain additional clues to these important elements and, and chemical compounds. But there is no asteroid sample return mission currently in development, at least that I'm aware of. Okay. But you, but as you say, you're going to be investigating this material for the next 40 years, probably. That's right. And, and beyond, I think it's going to be a treasure for generations to come. Well, how much material was brought back? We brought back 121.6 grams, which is more than twice what we promised NASA. Our mission requirement was 60 grams. So we're incredibly proud of that feat. 
Mm-hmm. Which doesn't sound like a lot, but like most of the experiments you're doing require just probably a very tiny amount of material, right? Yeah, we have electron microscopes. We can literally characterize things down to the atomic scale. We did a, a kind of a bottom-up estimate when we said, how much material do we need? And the scientists said, we need 15 grams to do all of the science that we're laying out on this nice. program. And NASA's requirement is we can't consume more than 25% of the sample. 75% has to be held for future researchers. So that's how we got to the 60. Nice. Dante, so you wrote a book that, that in part uh, covers this, right? Just this week, we released The Asteroid Hunter, which is really my personal journey on this mission. It starts out when I'm an undergraduate looking for a path in life. I get a amazing undergraduate opportunity to work on the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And that just fires me up. Most of the book mm-hmm. focuses on the 20 year journey I've been on to conceive, design, build, test, launch, fly, return, and now analyze these amazing samples from the asteroid. Where can people get your book? The book is available everywhere. Fine books are sold. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it at Barnes and Noble. Lots of local bookstores are carrying it. Should, That's awesome. Yeah, I should also say the audiobook version, I read most of it, but I worked with a good friend of mine, Sir Brian May from Queen, who does what we call the interludes. Underlying the grand Osiris Rex adventure is a cosmic journey where two carbon atoms are trying to reconnect after getting separated in the early solar system. One of those mm-hmm. is in my genetic code, and one of them is in Bennu. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Love it. Did you learn anything cool about Queen? Oh my goodness, I've learned so much. Brian and I did a second book. We released it last summer called Bennu 3D. Brian is a member of my science team and he's an expert in stereo imaging where he takes two images that are slightly offset in angle and with a stereoscope, you can see the surface pop out in 3D. That was a joint venture between his London Stereoscopic Company and the University of Arizona Press. But I got to hang out with him. We did a bunch of autograph signing. We started working on a little music together, and I've seen him play live now five different times. It's been an amazing partnership. Oh, wow. wow. That's awesome. And I should say, when he does his guitar solo, at least on the latest tour, he rises out of the stage riding Bennu uh, into his cosmos. (laughs) Of course he is. Of course he is. Oh, that is awesome. That's awesome, yeah. Yeah, he's he's a profound guitarist. I mean, God, his writing for Queen was just epic. Yeah, he really is a polymath. He's a pleasure to work with. Writing that book was a complete joy. He was a great collaborator, and and we're looking forward to some more adventures together. We'll both be at the Starmus, which is his Space Meets Music Festival that he holds every year. Uh, This year, it's going to be in uh, Bratislava. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And it was, uh, again, like we we covered this uh, two or three months ago. And then when I found out that I can get you on an interview, I'm like, yes, this is the exact person that we want to talk to about this because you're you're like, you know, you're ankle deep in the in the regular. That's right. <laughs> Literally some 50, days. 50 centimeters deep. That's right. 50 centimeters deep. We have a really cool animation of that that the Goddard Science Visualization Studio put out. If you want to see what actually happened to the spacecraft, it's frightening. I still shudder when I watch it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want to check that out. Well, Dante, thank you so much for joining us. This was fascinating. Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate it. It's time for Science or Fiction. Each week, I come up with three science news items or facts, two real and then one fake, and I challenge my panel of skeptics to tell me which one is the fake. We just have three regular news items this week. Are you guys ready? Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, here we go. Item number one, researchers have developed a universal exoskeleton control system that can work for any user without the need for extensive calibration or training. Item number two, scientists created a new method for using classic computers to error correct quantum computers, resulting in a 60 qubit quantum computer with an accuracy rate of 91%. And item number three, New material design allows for structural wood to create buildings as high as 18 stories. Jay, go first. Researchers have developed a universal exoskeleton control system that can work for any user without the need for extensive calibration or training. I mean, I I would think that we're about time for something like that. Extensive calibration. I mean, they'd have to fit it. 
to some degree. Uh, but I bet you that it could be very intuitive. I would say that one is science. Second one, scientists created a new method for using classic computers to error correct quantum computers, resulting in a 60 qubit quantum computer with an accuracy rate of 91%. I can't possibly see how scientists could use classic computers to error correct quantum computers. That goes against everything that I think I understand about quantum computing. All right, so that one is, is a definite maybe. The last one, new material design allows for structural wood to create buildings as high as 18 stories. Okay, I'm definitely going with number two, the quantum computer as the fake. That is definitely the fake. Okay, Evan? Well, I'm I'm probably going to wind up agreeing with Jay on this. Um, the exoskeleton control system. I don't know. Did anyone else think of, you know, Ripley jumping in the uh, yellow thing and just saying, you know, the load, the loading thing, walking around mm-hmm. like with no training, basically, and just no, she's le- learning it in two seconds. No, she, she actually used one for her job before she went on. She she went on this uh, that mission. Oh, yep. So oh, maybe yeah, I will change my based on that. I'll change my answer. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know about quantum computers. I'm very ignorant. Uh, 60 qubit quantum computer. I read something about it. Was it going to be a thou- 1,000 qubit coming or they did it? Well, that's the plan. They, I think IBM was planning 1,000. This year, I think they were hoping to, I think. Release. But this accuracy rate of 91%, I, I don't know if that's high, medium, low, where. You know, I, I just don't know enough about this. This is why I'm kind of, I think I'm going to call that one the fiction as well. But and the last one about a new material design, structural wood to go as high as eighteen stories. I suppose so. In theory, I'm not really sure why you would want to build an eighteen story wood structure in itself. So I'll I'll agree with Jay. Jay, you and I are together. Okay, Bob. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, the exoskeleton. I can buy that. I mean, at least there's some calibration training. It's just not extensive. I mean. You incorporate some AI in the tr- in the um, in the control system, and it's, it seems reasonable. The quantum computer one, though, ninety one percent. I haven't tracked this lately, but I know ninety one percent is very good. Um, it's, I mean, it's all for quantum computers. It's it's all about error correction. It really is. You could you could have a, a low qubit system, but if it were say, you know, very close to 100% error corrected, that would achieve amazing results, even if it's a low qubit. You don't need crazy qubits. As long as you have really, really good error correction, it could be dramatic. Uh, So 91 seems really high um, and it'd be a hell of a breakthrough. I really hope that's true. The third one, structure wood 18, that's that's uh, that's a, that's still pretty damn high. What, 180 feet? All wood for the structure? Wow. I I wouldn't be surprised if they had some freaky quantum breakthrough. And this is and this one is the is the fiction. That sounds quite high for wood. But in terms of just like the odds, I, I'm gonna have to go with quantum and say that that is probably gonna be fiction, and it's not quite as high as 91 percent. Okay, and Kara. So everyone is going with. Quantum computers? So far. Uh, <laughs> I don't know anything about quantum computers. So you're saying that read our book. S- something about the qubits <laughs> and the 91% is too high. The too many qubits and the too many percents. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know so more than I qubits, do, Kara. The accuracy of 91% is really good. The accuracy Very. is too high. I don't... Part of me wants to like... <laughs> Keep keep going on my crazy streak and like go out on a limb because I don't want Steve to sweep us. <laughs> like I don't know. Do I just want to play the odds here? Like the poker player in me is coming out. The exoskeleton one seems like too easy, but I I felt a few people hesitate on the structural wood. Yeah. So I don't know if I want to play the odds on that or not. Okay. Ugh, ugh. Okay. Especially I'm ge- after last week's defeat. I know. I'm, <laughs> I'm definitely and and I'm going last now. It's like, Carib, don't be stupid. Don't be stupid. Ooh. <laughs> Steve, I wish I could see Steve's face. This is the one thing about this being audio. Only. Oh, right. You need to tell. You're I a poker know. Player this is why a I'm a good poker player. I'm better at playing poker live than like computer poker. Steve, give me something. Steve, uh, turn on your camera. Quick. <laughs> 
I think I'm gonna do. I'm feeling reckless right now. I'm Uh-oh. gonna. I, I'm going out on a limb. I'm gonna say structural. What you know? I know nothing about quantum computers, and I know nothing about material science. So I'm literally rolling the dice and saying, structural wood. That's crazy. That's crazy. Eighteen oh stories. Gosh. There's no way. It's only eight stories or something. Or you made that up or something. all right kara going out on a limb i love it all right so you all agree on one we'll start there researchers have developed a universal exoskeleton control system that can work for any user without the need for extensive calibration or training you all think this one is science and this one is science Uh, and of course nice man of course about it evan all the reporting mentions ripley and aliens Yes. With the exoskeleton. <laughs> so this is like, so, you know, the idea is that you build a robotic exoskeleton that can help somebody who's paralyzed walk, for example. And the problem is that these systems all need extensive calibration and training. Not to mention the batteries. Yeah, but I'm just in terms just get to you, get it to work for a person. But this new system can is basically like off the shelf. It works right away. Uh, it doesn't need any calibration or training. And Bob, no. you hit on it. It's AI. Of course yeah. it's AI. Yeah, of course. Yeah. AI. So AI basically trains itself as you use it, and then that's it. So it, That's great. Yeah. Man. How much energy is it going to take? Well, I mean, this is, yeah, this is <laughs> yeah. not an improvement in the design of the robot itself, just the control system. And, yeah. But it's a huge, this was a huge impediment to getting this to people who need to use it clinically, right? Is that, mm-hmm. yeah, if there's months of training, you'll be able to walk sort of with it. You know, now it's, it, it reduces that time and, and could work right off the shelf. So that's, it's a huge advance, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, I guess we'll take these in order. Scientists have created a new method for using quant- classic computers to error correct quantum computers, resulting in a 60 qubit quantum computer with an actu- accuracy rate of 91%. So you guys have threw out a lot of comments there, some of which are kind of correct. So, Jay, this is what happens now all the time. Classic computers are used to error correct quantum computers, that's how they work, right? Uh, again, it's in the, it's in our yeah. book, uh, but <laughs> yeah. So the problem is the problem is that classic. You know, the whole point of quantum computers is that there are certain calculations that they could do orders of magnitude faster than classic computers. So you rapidly get beyond what a classic computer can do, right? And, you know, except for like the smallest, you know, qubit quantum computers. So you know, improving. Er, Bob is correct. Error correction is the game at this point. That's like the big limiting factor with quantum computers. So any advance in the ability to error correct them would be huge. But did they do it? And oh. is is the are the numbers accurate? Well, this one is the fiction. Ah, yeah. Oh. Uh, because too bad, I'm bummed. I'm kind of bummed, even though I got it right. Uh, the yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Bob wanted it. Yeah, in a way, you want it to be. So true. first of all, it wasn't really a quantum computer; it was a quantum simulator, which is a type of quantum uh. computer. But whatever, it was. It's it's a little different. Uh, no, but that's that's it. That's cool, though. That's a whole that thing, man. Kind of, and okay. the accuracy was nine percent. The error rate was ninety one percent. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh inver thought. inversion. Jesus. But nine percent is awesome because the previous what? benchmark was like one percent. Like one percent accuracy rate is considered very high for a quantum computer. So getting it up to nine percent really? is huge. Yeah. Look at that. But yeah, 91's crazy. That's like we're, we're that's obviously an order of magnitude greater than where we are. So how did they do it? What was the new method? The new method was using classic computers in series with so they 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 liken it to like you know draw doing a painting with increasingly smaller brushes act, adding increasingly smaller details. Yeah. Right. So you don't you're not relying on on one classic computer to give you the same amount of detail as a quantum computer. They once you get beyond a certain point with quantum computers, you can't. Again, that's the whole idea. So you just use a series of classic computers to try to – by each one subsequently adding a little bit more detail to you know, the, the answer. And then you eventually you get an answer that's detailed enough that you can error correct the quantum computer to see did the, did the quantum computer get the correct answer, you know, basically. Uh, and so they were able to get a 60-qubit system up to – nine percent accuracy which is huge so okay it's actually an incremental advance in quantum computing but but fairly solid 
All this means that new material design allows for structural wood to create buildings as high as 18 stories is science. Sorry, Kara. So yeah, I tried. Two <laughs> weeks in a row. That's like even more I'm rare for you. But anyway, keeping things interesting. I, well, I, which I appreciate I mean, that. I really do. <laughs> it was a clearly stated gamble. Yes. yes. <laughs> Evan, you asked the question, why would you want to build an 18-story building out of wood? Well, there's a very yeah. good reason, and that oh. is because of the carbon footprint of the building. So mm -hmm. steel and concrete are huge carbon emitters, whereas if you build it out of wood, it's a carbon sink, right? You are locking that carbon in the wood. And for whatever, that building's going to survive for 100 years, you're tying up that carbon for 100 years rather than releasing carbon because of – through – steel and concrete. So that's why that's why you would do so it. So these so so these 18 story buildings would be of equal quality and structural integrity and everything else. Well, so what what happened was that the the uh international standards were altered to basically now allow for wooden structures up to 18 stories cuz prior to that it was like you couldn't do it. You couldn't get approval for that design because but they were outdated they were based upon the timber that we had at the time but there's recent material science advances in timber basically using like cross grain laminates i think is a big one where you essentially uh. yeah you sort of have laminated wood with the, where you're deliberately making the grain go in different directions so it adds a lot of strength That's new well i think it's just uh, these are not Totally new. The point is they're getting really good, and they finally updated the international standards to a account for okay. these more recent advances in in what's called mass timber. And they basically said, yeah, the mass timber we have today, you can build it. You could safely build an 18-story structure out of them. Um, they're also yeah, – well, man. Also, they can let's apparently be beautiful. Like the, just aesthetically, it gives, it gives architects a lot of options. Oh, sure. Yeah, and they could be very, very Gee. pretty. It'll look well, like, yeah, yeah the, the Elven Kingdoms from uh, yeah, you know, right. Lord of the Rings, basically. Uh, so, and I've seen some some of them. They are beautiful. So, yeah, so it's it, – and, yeah, just we just build a bunch of stuff out of wood and it actually becomes a huge carbon sink rather than a carbon release. You know, like anything, it's always a drop. Every, everything's a drop in the bucket, but you've got to add them all together, you know. Sure. It, it moves the ball forward a little bit. All right. Well, good job, guys. Thank you. Evan, you got Thanks. a quote for this week? I do. One takes comfort from the fact that there is no Gresham's Law in science. In the long run, good science drives out bad. Martin Gardner. Oh, I know so, him. I mean, I you don't do know, know him. him but. You should know him. <laughs> we Every good skeptic should know Martin Gardner. So what's Gresham's Law? Uh, Gresham's Law. Bad money drives out good. Perhaps you've heard that expression before. Mm -hmm. In other words, if I have a $100 bill and I have a little piece of gold that's would be today's value worth $100, a person will tend to pay for something, assuming the vendor will take it, using that $100 paper bill, which is considered the bad money because gold, you know, has more properties to it intrinsically in its value and it can go up in its value, whereas the $100 bill you hand over is considered not, not, as, not as good as the gold. So the bad money will be spent first mm -hmm. and a person will hoard what they feel is the good stuff. So bad money drives out the good money. But it, but he says good science drives out bad science. Right. Yeah. Yep. So you can't have Gresham. No Gresham's law in science. Yeah. I so. agree that is in the long run. But that, in the long that could run. take time. It, it does take a lot of time for mm -hmm. that process to play itself out. In the meantime, people will spread the bad science if it's profitable. Like in in medicine, like it can take 15 to 20 years to really know the answer to a complicated clinical question. In the meantime, you got to practice medicine with the preliminary, you know, sometimes bad information. And even worse, there are snake oil salesmen who will be more than happy to sell you the bad science while mm -hmm. in that during the preliminary phase. And then when it eventually gets driven out by good science, they, they move on to the next thing because there's always something in that preliminary part of the process, you know. Yes, yeah, so unscrupulous people will take advantage of those gaps. Absolutely. Right. So it does work Sad. in the long run, but it doesn't mean we don't have to deal with a lot of bad science or pseudoscience in the short run. All right, guys. Well, thank you all for joining me this week. Sure, man. Thanks, you Steve. Thank you, Steve. And until next week, this is your Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Skeptic's Guide to the Universe is produced by SGU Productions. 
dedicated to promoting science and critical thinking. For more information, visit us at theskepticsguide.org. Send your questions to info at theskepticsguide.org. And if you would like to support the show and all the work that we do, go to patreon.com slash skepticsguide and consider becoming a patron and becoming part of the SGU community. Our listeners and supporters are what make SGU possible.